Have you ever thought about what the end of the world would be like? When was the last time you thought that it was curtains for humans? What did you do to prepare yourself? Well, today I will be telling you a story about a time that people thought they were in for the greatest economic disaster to ever hit humankind. But it didn't happen. That's right, we're going to be talking about Y2K, or the greatest economic disaster that could have happened. What exactly was the Y2K problem? What potential economic implications could it have had on society should it have happened? And what was done in order to prevent us from getting into a bind? Sit back and relax as we take a closer look at Y2K. Welcome back to Business Explained. Let's get into it. Let's shed a little light on the situation. The years leading up to and during World War II were crucial in the history of computing. This was when powerful computers began to appear. In 1938, Konrad Seuss, a German engineer, constructed the world's first programmable binary computer called the Z1. The year after, an American physicist named John Atanasov and his assistant Clifford Berry, an electrical engineer, were able to build a more complex binary machine, which they called the Atanasov Berry Computer, which had the ability to store many binary digits. These machines were digital, and they were an upgrade from the analog machines that people were used to. Perhaps the predecessor of the computers that we're used to today was made by mathematicians Howard Aiken back in 1944 at Harvard University, which was known as either the Harvard Mark I or the IBM Automatic Sequence Control Calculator. Computers were developed throughout the years, and more and more businesses and consumers began utilizing computers to get about their daily activities. Computers were also used to program a lot of the new devices and tech we have today. However, in 1997, more and more articles also began to appear in trade magazines and in the press talking about something called the Y2K problem. Well, decades ago in the 60s, computer memory was incredibly expensive. Programmers decided to find ways to use as little of the computer memory as they possibly could, which led to many programs being created with 2 bytes instead of 4 bytes. For example, instead of putting in 1977, they would just put 77. Now, for a time, this type of system was working. However, looking back, you could probably say that they weren't very forward-thinking as they did not take into consideration what would happen when the year 2000 comes around, and the 99 from the year 1999 would turn into 00, zero to represent the year 2000. This was a problem because the program would assume that the 00, zero represented the year 1900, which could mess up things like analyzing the expiration dates on a credit card. The new millennium would mean that more systems would have to be able to distinguish the difference between the dates of two centuries to avoid problems. Try taking a look at new credit cards you may have. A lot of them already have expiration dates in the next century, and those are intended to prevent confusion at the credit card terminal. However, the Y2K problem actually went deeper than that. Processors embedded in both simple and large machines may also experience the problem brought about by the changing of the century. Experts had already brought up this potential problem for years, but it seemed to be thrust into the spotlight in 1997. Talks surrounding the Y2K problem, also known as the Y2K bug, was getting hotter. Articles and various write-ups detailing the problem on the internet, which was relatively new at the time, fanned the flames. They all had variations of the same message. Once the year 2000 came around, the world would be plunged into disaster. And they didn't just mean things like computer glitches and non-working credit cards. They meant major-scale catastrophes, like power failures causing blackouts all over the globe, machines would malfunction, transportation methods like airplanes would suddenly just drop from the sky, and cars would be uncontrollable or stop running altogether. It caused a whole lot of panic. So what did people do to address this? President Clinton spearheaded preparation efforts mid-1998, spending roughly $100 billion in coordinating with national and local levels. Globally, other nations checked their own systems to see what could be done to prevent being doomed. People began to stock up on their own supplies, uncertain of what would happen. It was what was called as an anticipation of a computer-induced apocalypse. The news got into it by talking about the possibility of all systems failing. However, experts were working hard to avoid the problem, and they were confident that the year 2000 wouldn't bring any problems. This is what Paul Safo, futurist and adjunct professor at Stanford University, had to say. 
The Y2K crisis didn't happen precisely because people started preparing for it over a decade in advance. And the general public, who was busy stocking up on supplies and stuff, just didn't have a sense that the programmers were on the job. When 2000 rolled around and nothing as catastrophic happened, people breathed a collective sigh of relief. Until some got the idea that the Y2K bug was nothing but a big hoax. However, avoiding the Y2K bug was a lesson in preparedness. Programmers worked in the background, working long hours and racing against the clock to prepare this potential disaster. In an article that Francine Numa wrote for Time, looking at the whole thing 20 years later, she had this to say. The innumerable programmers who devoted months and years to implementing fixes received scant recognition. One programmer recalls the reward for a five-year project at his company, lunch, and a pen. It was a tedious, unglamorous effort, hardly the stuff of heroic narratives, nor conducive to an outpouring of public gratitude, even though some of the fixes put in place in 1999 are still used today to keep the world's computer systems running smoothly. What do you think about the Y2K problem? Do you think it really could have been the greatest economic disaster to ever hit mankind if people did not take it seriously? Let me know what your thoughts are. Comment them down below in the comment section and I'll be responding to all of you who comment during the first hour of me posting this video. If you enjoyed this video, you should check out my other video titled Technology and Tax Cuts – How Will Biden Change the Economy? It seems that during the first half of November, the United States national elections were all that anyone could talk about. The race between Republican Donald Trump and Democrat Joe Biden was too tight for comfort, with much protest over the counting of the ballots from Trump himself. However, it was Biden who came out victorious, winning both the popular vote and the electoral college vote. Now America can look forward to the 20th of January 2021, the day that Joseph R. Biden Jr. is expected to be sworn in as the 46th President of the United States and Kamala Harris, the Vice President-elect, will be sworn in as the first female Vice President in the history of the United States. However, there are many questions up in the air. How will Biden help the economy recover? What are his plans to tackle the coronavirus pandemic, especially considering that the United States has the highest number of active cases in the world? Is he really going to be imposing higher taxes on the citizens? Will he deliver on the promises he made during campaign season? Well, we're going to be taking a look at all of those and more, so check out Technology and Tax Cuts – How Will Biden Change the Economy? And join me as we dive into the topic for that video – How is Biden's presidency going to change for the economy? Stay tuned, stay educated.